Okay, welcome to the tutorial. This is going to be a tutorial on how to install FreeBSD 12.1. That's the latest release as of uh, July of 2020. Um, and we're going to install it into VirtualBox. In this case, I'm going to use in VirtualBox version 6.1, but this will work in any version that I know exists. So um, we're going to install it into VirtualBox. It can be installed to hardware as well, just to, to be aware. But anyhow, so we've got three requirements that we need to make sure that we meet um, as prerequisites. And the first is that you have an OS capable of doing virtualization. I've got, this is on a MacBook Pro, this is a Mac OS Mojave, but I've done it on Windows, Linux, and everything else in between. Um, pretty much any reasonable non-Chromebook hardware should work. Um, it's better the more memory you got. If you have eight gigs of RAM, that's a good start. If you have 16, that's awesome. 32 is more than I got. So that's the main thing. The second thing you need to do is you're going to need to get VirtualBox. So if you go to virtualbox.org, it's going to come up like this. We're going to go to the download area. I'm going to pick your host. I'm going to pick Mac because that's what I got, but you could pick Windows as well. Anyway, you're going to save it and then open it and install it and then you'll probably reboot because it's going to need to set up virtual networking and that's going to be it for VirtualBox. We're not going to need anything more, but you can kind of get a, you can look at screenshots, you can see what it's supposed to look like and all that kind of stuff, but we don't care. But the other requirements, prerequisite you're going to need is free FreeBSD. You're going to need the install media. So we go to FreeBSD.org, which is the main website for FreeBSD. Uh, it's got Beastie on there. Um, Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to download it. So we go to Get FreeBSD. We're going to look at release information. We can read about the releases here, all the releases going back in time, um, and the more recent versions. We're going to do. We're going to get 12.1, but we're going to get it from here. Get FreeBSD. Click there. Choose an architecture, um, an image. We're going to look at these. These are kind of all the many, many, many different kinds there are. There's stuff for the Pi. Stuff for the beagle bone, all these kind of stuff, but we're for embedded images. But we're going to use this serious stuff over here. Um, there are VM images already available. We could do that. We're not going to. We're going to install just like we would to a hardware device. Um, we're going to pick AMD 64, but you should know that i386 is there in case you had a 32 bit ancient machine you wanted to install it on. You could use that, or if you need to simulate 32 bit hardware. But this AMD 64 is the Intel 64-bit version. It works for both Intel um, and other 64-bit Intel-like architectures like AMD. Uh, AMD defined the 64-bit extensions way back when, and so it's, they got the name. But this works for Intel. So we go here. We look at the list. We're, there's a bunch of different kinds here. There's boot only. Who knows what that's for? You probably don't need that. Um, there's disk one, which is a CD version. That's what we're going to download. It's pretty pretty small, um, you know, 800 megs or whatever. Um, and then there's a DVD image, which is two and a half gigabytes. Um, you could do that if you wanted to burn it to a DVD, but it's not necessary. The CD is plenty. Um, the MemStick version, that's the version if you're going to install the hardware that you put on a USB stick and that's all you need as long as you have network access. It'll do the rest on the off the internet. Mini MemStick, not worthwhile. Don't worry about it. But the one you want, the CD image is disk one. Click it, download it, save it, we'll use it later. That's kind of it. The other thing I'm going to tell you about this uh, website, freebsd.org, is that if you need help, go to the community, go to forums, ask your questions. If you want to look at the handbook, go to documentation, look at the handbook, and you can read all these other million other, one other things that they have going on here. Um, they have upcoming events that are interesting. They have FreeBSD Fridays where you can get online and watch it for an hour, uh, listen or interact with them, go to the chat site and ask questions, they'll answer them. Um, or, and then there's uh, office hours as well. So those are some of the cool things. The FreeBSD Journal is free now, so you can read articles about FreeBSD in the journal. Okay, enough of that. Now, I guess one last thing. Security advisories pop up here too. If you're using one of these services, you should at least read the errata or whatever and find out what the problem is and be aware of it. They fix them pretty quick, so you don't have to worry too much, but should at least be aware. All right, next up, we're going to kick off the installer. So I start VirtualBox. VirtualBox comes up. It's a um, relatively compact um, 
software. And we're gonna we're gonna pick from this top menu. We're gonna pick new to create a new instance. We'll call it FreeBSD test just to give it a name. You may want to just call it FreeBSD. I've already got one of those, so it's gonna ask you where you want to put it. The, usually the default is in your home directory and VirtualBox VMs. The type you want is BSD. Since I typed BSD, it picked it. Um, otherwise, you'd have to pick it from the list. It can emulate all kinds of stuff. Um, and then you pick your version of that software. FreeBSD 64-bit is exactly what we want. So we're going to click Continue. We're not going to use Expert Mode. It's going to pop up with a minimum of 1 gig of RAM for this type of instance. We're going to Bump it up to two, 2 gigs, which is 2048. We could type it in here if we wanted to, too. Um, I've got lots of RAM, but 2 gigs is enough for what we're doing. If I really thought I'd be doing a lot, I might put it up to 4 gigs, um, which is still way less than I have, but 2 gigs is good. So continue. We're going to create the disk. We're going to create a hard disk for this to live on. Um, it says the recommended size is 16. We're going to ignore that. We're going to at least, but we're aware of it. We're going to create a virtual disk right now, so I click Create. It's going to ask what kind, and I'm going to pick the default, which is a VirtualBox disk image, but these others will work too. I click Continue. It's going to say, do I want to store this as a dynamically allocated disk or a fixed size? I said a 20, I'm going to say a 20 gig hard drive. Well, I don't want to use up 20 gigs of my hard drive right now, but in case it needs it, I need it to be big enough to hold everything it's going to ever have, so I say 20 gigs is plenty but I don't want it to all be allocated right now. So I'm gonna say dynamic, which is the default. I'll click continue. I'm gonna change it from 16 to 20. Um, I've got 100 gigs free or something probably right now. Yeah, 120 gigs. Your disk may only have 120 gigs or 128 gigs, in which case 20 gigs is a lot. Um, you may need to reduce that down to 16 or less. But once I create it, it's not gonna actually allocate um, that much storage, it's going to use less. I'll show you that in a minute, but um, we're ready to configure the machine now. It's got some basic defaults that we set when we ran it, but we're going to change some. So we're going to click on General, and it's going to pop up, and it's going to let me change all the settings. This is what we picked when we did the installation. I'm not changing it. We could look at Advanced. This is talking about shared clipboard, drag and drop, a snapshot folder. We're not changing anything here going to leave it. We could write a description here. This is a test system. We could do disk encryption. We're not going to. But we're moving on to the next tab, which is system. In system, it's already got my two gigs of memory selection. It has a enable IO pick, a pick um, selected, which is important. Um, we're going to leave that. We could enable the EFI. If I did, then I'd have a resolution issue right now, so I'm going to leave it. But that is probably a good idea if you're doing this on your own because it will let your uh, console scale better in the um, in your default. But I've got this resolution is very small, so I'm not going to do it. For processors, I'm going to pick two processors because I've got lots, but uh, you may not have so many. So one CPU is plenty, but two is better. Um, if we were using more than four gigs of RAM, we'd need this PAE or... Uh, extended memory stuff, but we're not needing it. We're not going to do any acceleration. We're going to leave it at the defaults. We move on to the display tab. In display, I can make changes here, but I'm not going to. I could also choose to enable a remote display that I could um, use like um, VNC or something to look at um, without actually seeing the, the console. I could also record the sessions, but I'm not going to. All right, so back to the main tabs. I go to storage. It's got my hard drive. It's a 20 gig hard drive, but right now it's using two megs. And as I install stuff, it'll get bigger and bigger. But for right now, it's going to be tiny, which is what I want. The CD uh, player is empty, but we're going to select one. So I'm going to choose, I'm going to click on the little CD here. I'm going to click choose a disk file. It already knows where I put all my ISS, but you'll have to browse to them. Um, the one we're looking for is this 12.1 release. Disk one, it's a CD image. It's uh, 910 megabytes, so not too big. We're gonna click it, say open, and that's gonna be as though I put it into the CD tray and closed it. Next up, audio, I'm not making any changes. 
to network, I'm going to make a change. I'm going to go into this advanced settings here. The, the network address translation is good. We want that. We're going to leave the device settings all the way they are. Cable's connected. It's got a MAC address. It thinks it's an Intel Pro. Um, but I'm going to change this port forwarding here so we can do SSH into the box. I'm going to add one. Click on the little plus sign. I'm going to double click in here and call it SSH. Protocols TCP, the host IP I'm not messing with. I'm going to change the port to 2000. So it'll run, it'll seem to the local machine, the Mac, that there's a SSH server running on 2000. But in reality, it's going to run on the guest on its normal port 22. So when I SSH into my Mac at port 2000, it's going to log in to this uh, virtual instance on port 22. I'm going to say OK. And I'm not going to mess with the other adapters. They're fine. They're empty. I'm going to look at ports. I could set up serial ports here, and I could set up USB here. I'm not going to do either one. I go to shared. I could add uh, folders. I could add a shared folder where I could put stuff in it and pick it up in the virtual instance. But we're using SSH. We don't need that. And I could mess with the user interface somehow. Don't do it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't bother with that. We just say OK. So we went through all the settings, we've changed them, they're ready to go. So at this point, we're going to begin the install. Um, we're going to start the machine. So just like powering on a physical device, we're going to power this one on. We've got options on how to start it. We could start it with normal start, which is it'll pop up with a little window and it'll look like, uh, like a virtual desktop. Uh, I could do a headless start where it just starts the machine, but nothing appears. That's not terribly useful right now, but it will be later. And detachable start, not, uh, not too sure what that is, but you can read about it. The default is the normal start, so we're just going to click the start button. When we do that, it's going to pop up another window. And it's going to be our little machine, FreeBSD test, powered off. It's not on yet, um, but it says select the disk file that has the, the boot information. And since we don't really have anything yet, we're going to pick this BSD disk 1 to start off with, and we're going to click Start, which will power on the machine with the CD in the drive, virtually. All right, starts up, splash screen, stop, starts FreeBSD, and it says, hey, and we're going to auto boot in 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. It's going to pick that first entry, boot multi-user. You could also press Enter or the number one. It's going to show you some boot uh, messages. All the ones in the bright white are kernel messages. They're being uh, displayed by starting services and whatnot. And all of the kind of light gray ones are informational messages. It pops up with the welcome message here and behind the UHub 0 12 ports um, message that kind of displayed over the top, there's some stuff. So I'm going to move the, uh, the arrow keys left and right so I can see what's in there. Um, but it has install and shell. Install was the auto, was the default. You could have just pressed enter, which is what we're going to do anyway, but I just wanted to show you that there are the way to display hidden text when it does crazy stuff like this. Um, Linux does this too, but you have to try real hard. Um, but we're going to install it. You could also do a shell right now, but for right now we're going to do install. The shell is useful if you break something and you need a, uh, a way to get to shell and your system isn't working anymore. Um, it's an emergency thing, but we're going to pick install and it's going to bring up the key map selection If you're using if you're using a key map or if you're using a keyboard, that's not an English keyboard like um, Japanese keyboard or something like that You can pick it from here and then you can type normal Japanese characters or what have you I'm going to continue with the default key map, which is the US as it says right there the system console driver For FreeBSD defaults to standard US keyboard map, but you could pick something else so I'm just, it's already selected, but if I wanted to, I can move my map, uh, key, key, arrow keys around and then make sure the right one's selected and then hit enter. Or hit tab to move from that to the bottom and then you can pick select. Either way, just press enter. All right, now it says set the host name. We can call it whatever we want. I'm going to call it FreeBSD um, and that's all I'm going to call it. You could also call it FreeBSD.home or local or whatever you want it to. But... It's a name that you're going to remember and use as the name of the machine. I'm going to click OK. I'm going to hit return. Um, and it's going to say, hey, what distribution do you want to select? And I'm going to get choices here. 
Um, I could do a base system with debugging on. I could use kernel debugging modules, lib32 compatibility and debug, all this stuff. There's all kinds of cool stuff. For right now, we're going to pick lib32. Um, actually, we're, these are already selected. Kernel debug, fine, I don't care. We're not really going to use it, but no point in unselecting it. Lib32, we do ports, source, tests. All these are available after you do the installation. To get a base system running, we don't need anything else than this. So I'm going to just press enter. All right, it says, how would you like to partition your disk? And if you were doing this on hardware, I'd say do it as ZFS. Um, ZFS rocks the world, best file system on the planet. Uh, no, no competition whatsoever. Um, and if you may want to do that just for fun too, but it does eat a little bit of memory. And since we're memory constrained of this, I'm just going to do it with auto UFS. UFS was the main file system for decades. So a lot of people still use it. Uh, if you're familiar with Linux, it's like ext3. Um, and then we could do manual or we could open another shell and try this by hand. But since we're on a VM, we're going to use it all anyway. So we're going to say auto UFS, press enter. So it says, hey, what would you like to, would you like to use the whole disk? And I'm going to say, yes, I would. Otherwise, I have to learn a bit more about partitioning. When I, when I choose the entire disk, it's going to ask me what kind of partition do I want to use. And I could use any of these, but since I didn't pick EFI as my partition type at the beginning, if you did, you'll want to use GPD, the GUID partition table. But since I didn't, I'm going to use MBR, which is the old school, how it used to be with DOS and all that kind of stuff. Windows uses it. Um, they're start, I think they're starting to use GPT, but you know, Windows is like decades behind. But whatever. Anyway, we're going to go on. So there's the MBR. Um, and it's going to create some partitions. It's going to create this on this device called ADA0. That's the device name for the hard, hard disk. It would be similar if you had it on your um, on physical hardware. But the device name indicates what kind of device it is. In this case, I don't know, uh, AHCI or something, a uh, TAPI device. But it's uh, ADA is the kind of the identifier and zero is the unit. We only have one drive, so it's zero. All right, and then there's a partition or a slice uh, for BSD. It's 20 gigabytes. It's the whole disk. And within the slice, we create two partitions. Um, it created them. I didn't have to worry about it, but there are two slices, the A slice and the B slice. Uh, sorry, the A partition and the B partition. The A partition is, um, is 19 gigs in length, and it's a UFS partition and it's called slash, it's the root partition. And the B partition, it's one gig in size and it's swap space, which we really don't need, but eh, it's good to have it, so why not? So we could do, we could create, delete, modify, revert, or automatically, which we did, um, change the partitions, but we're just gonna say finish, we're done with the partition step. And then it's gonna say, hey, are you sure about this? You're gonna commit or you're gonna revert and exit, you go back, whatever you need to do. In this case, I'm, it sounds good to me, I'm gonna commit, so I commit, it does it, it starts to do the install of the um, distribution. I'm um, sorry, the, the OS. This really isn't a distribution. I know it's called Berkeley Software Distribution, but it's, uh, it's an OS. Um, Linux is a distribution typically because Linux has the, the base kernel and then a whole bunch of um, user land uh, stuff in apps and stuff from here, stuff from there. Uh, BSD, pretty much everything is written in either the BSD kernel or in the BSD user land. Both are maintained by BS freebsd.org, um, the developers. And then you can add packages, which is will do. But it's kind of a different philosophy. The kernel is um, much more contained than, than Linux. Not a, bad, not a good thing, not a bad thing necessarily. Um, they're just different ways of approaching things. All right, the previous D install is done. We're just gonna do some administrative tasks before we leave the installer. Um, it's gonna say, hey, what do you want the password to be for the system management account? Root is the management account. It's uh, Lord of the Realm and all that. Anything that can be done, can be done by root. Um, it's gonna not echo the characters as I typed in, but I'm gonna type in a password for root that I'm going to remember, or it's not gonna do me very good. 
Let's type it in, press enter. It says retype it. I type it again. If I got it right, it moves on. If not, it tells me, hey, you got that wrong. And the next step it's gonna ask me about is that network configuration. We told it we'll take an Intel Pro as our virtual adapter, so that looks good. I'm just gonna press enter. If this was a real machine, it would possibly be different, like RA0 if it was a real tech um, type of device, or uh, let's see, what else could it, I mean, it could be anything, but IWM if it was some kind of Intel wireless. That kind of thing, but we're get, it got it. It selected something, yay! So I'm gonna say okay. And then it says, "Would you like to configure IPv4?" This is the old school, normal um, IP stuff, and we're gonna say yes. Would you like to use DHCP to configure this interface? Um, VirtualBox is providing the DHCP service for this instance, so we're gonna say yep. It's gonna get a lease. That's just telling us that when it sent the network was down, but it's gonna get past this. And then it's gonna come back and it's gonna say, hey, would you like to configure IPv6 for this interface? And if you have IPv6 service up in your network, you could say yes, but I'm gonna say no. It's more headache than it's worth. Um, the, I think there's like 10% of the websites out there, if that, have IPv6. So there's not a lot of value in doing it. It's just convenient for big people down the road. Anyway, I'm gonna say no. It's gonna say network configuration resolver. The resolver is a process within Unix that's going to resolve uh, host names. When you type in yahoo.com, it's gonna be like, how is, how's it gonna find out what yahoo.com is? Um, in this case, my DHCP server on the network has already pre-populated a couple of DNS servers, but if not, you can type your own, but that's how it's going to resolve those names. Um, I'm also gonna, I'm gonna leave search empty because I don't have one, but if I did, if I had done freebsd.home, then I might type home here because that way it would go, it would just uh, resolve those internally. But the IPv4 instances, I'm sorry, the, the addresses for host names, the DNS uh, servers that I have set up here are 208.67.222.222 and 208.67.222.20. That's open DNS. Um, if you are happy with uh, providing you know, all of your traffic uh, request through Google. You could do Google 8.8.8.8 and then 8.8.4.4 um, are their DNS servers and then your ISP might have others. Anyway, pick a couple of decent DNS servers here and that way when you type yahoo.com it'll find out where that goes. So we say okay. And then it says time zone selector and you can pick your time zone here. I tend to be in North America so I'm going to pick two for North America and then if I page down a few times here uh, yeah, well, whatever. Then you get US of A, 49. And then 11 is central time. Uh, that's my time zone. So I say, hey, that's, does CDT work? During daylight savings time, yes. All right, going to say yes. Then it's going to say, hey, do you want to set the time and date? You look at it. Is today August 3rd, 2020? It sure is. So I'll skip that. Does it look like 903.04 look good to you? No, not really. So I'm going to set the time. Um, and to do that, I'm going to use my arrow keys. Going to get it down to like, uh, I guess we'll go to 14, 03, 04. That looks good. And then hit enter when you get the time right. I'm using 203. And then it's got some services. What services do you want to start at boot? And unless you've been here, so this is Greek. So I'll explain it. So local unbound, that's the local caching validating resolver. That's just a cache for DNS. So yeah, it's a good idea. It speeds things up a lot. You don't always have to be hitting Google or wherever. It just, if it already knows where that address resolves to, it'll just use your local. Um, and then that's a good thing. We're gonna use the SSH secure shell, absolutely. So we make sure that's selected. We're gonna select the mouse daemon. Um, if, you're on a, if you're on an EFI capable real machine, you don't need that, but if you're doing it in VirtualBox, I think you need it. All right, NTP date, that's handy, but we're not gonna use it. Um, we don't really need it. It's also, it's not deprecated yet, but it's on the way out. So we'll pick NTPD. Um, that'll keep our network up to date. It'll require a little bit of extra work later, but we're not worried about it right now. And then PowerD, adjust the CPU frequency dynamically if supported, sure, why not? And the dump daemon, absolutely. 
All right, so the only thing we didn't pick was NTP date, and we could have picked it. It wouldn't have hurt anything, but we're going to move on. All right, system hardening. This is, this is a great idea, especially if you're going to product, put your server in production, um, but it's going to require some investigation on your part to figure out what the heck it means. Um, you, these are pretty reasonable, but once you turn them all on, system parts of your system are going to stop working, and you're going to, you're going to be wondering why. You have to go read up, oh, I see, I disabled that. Now I have to go give certain special permissions to these users. So I'm going to skip all that. I'm just going to say, okay. All right, it's going to come to the add user accounts, and we are going to add one user. That's us. Um, would you like to add users to the system? Yeah, we do. So we're going to say yes. It's going to ask you, what, what's your username? And I'm WSIN. That's me. So I'm going to say that. You could say whatever, Joe, Bob, Mary, Susie, um, um, Geetha, whatever it is, and type that in. We're going to just say enter when we get that. Then we can enter a full name. I'm going to go Wilson. That's me too. And then UID. I'm going to leave that empty for the default. It's going to pick one. It's going to pick the next one, which in this case I think is 1,000 or 1,001. So we're just going to let it pick it. And then we're going to say what's our login group. It is definitely WSEN. That's my name. Um, we're going to let that Create that, and then say, and say, login group is WSIN. Invite WSIN into other groups. Yeah, we need to be part of a couple of other groups, three other groups. So we're going to add this user, WSIN, that we're just creating to a, a group called Wheel. And then we're going to hit space, and we're going to add them to operator and a space, and then we're going to add them to video. And those three groups will get added. It'll get added to those, and those will be readily available. The login class, we're going to pick default. That's a reasonable thing. And then we pick another shell. Um, the shell that if you've ever used a terminal in any Unix-like operating system, uh, Bash is probably the one that you've seen, or ZSH or something like that. They're all based on SH at some level. That was the original um, Born shell, um, Stephen R. Born um, of Bell Labs. But SH is still... It's still useful and still works just fine all by itself. But later we'll switch to Bash, and Bash will have some uh, command line history features that we really appreciate, tab completion, stuff like that. But for right now, we're going to pick SH. CSH is, uh, some people love it. Um, it's a C-like shell, um, but we're not doing it. TCSH is like T, it's like C shell, but, but uh, kind of more, I think more modern. Um, no login is not a good idea. You can't log in if you have no login as your shell. So pick sh to get to pick the default. Just press enter. Whatever's in the brackets will be selected. Your home directory, home wsn. That looks good to me. Home, it'll be have your name there. Home directory permissions leave empty for the defaults. Yeah, unless you're super smart, uh, you know they already don't mess with that. Use password based authentication. Yeah, we'll do that. Use an empty password. No, we won't be doing that. Use a random password. Not on a million years. We're going to say no. Then we get to type it in, so we'll type in a nice password that we like. Hopefully we'll get it right the second time, but maybe not. They didn't match. Use an empty password. No. Uh, use a random password. No. Enter your password. Yes. <laughs> this time I'll type it right. All right. Lock out the account after creation. That wouldn't be very helpful, so we're going to say no. And then it gives us the, the overview, and it says, hey, Username WSIN, not going to tell you your password. Here's your full name, Will Sin. The UID is 1001. The class is empty, the default. Uh, you're going to belong to WSIN or your name, wheel, operator, and video. Uh, we can fix these later, but it's better if they're right now. If they're not, just say no here and do it again. All right, we're going to check the home directory looks okay. The home mode looks good. The shell has been SH. That's good, and it's not locked. We're good to go. Is it okay? We're going to say yes. Type the whole word yes. Hit enter. It says, hey, we did that. Do you want to do another one? No. I'm pretty much done. So we say no, and it brings us back to the uh, graphical console, graphical, not so graphical um, install window thing. And um, we can do all kinds of cool stuff here. We can install the handbook if we wanted to. We could fix some of the things that we might have got wrong. But I'm good with it. I'm going to just say exit. So I say exit, and it's going to say, hey, 
before we bail, do you want to do, do you need us to open a shell, make any final system modifications? And I'm just going to say no. And it's going to say, do you want to reboot? And I'm going to say, sure. So I hit enter for reboot. It's going to reboot. At which point I should probably eject this CD, which I may not be in time to do. I'm not in time to do, so I'm going to just power it off. All right, so probably better to just power it off to begin with, but that's okay. All right, I want to eject the CD. So go into the storage tab here, and I'm going to eject this by removing disk. So I'll remove disk from virtual hard drive. Click that, and it goes empty again. And now we're ready to start the machine without the CD ROM. Let me check my notes real quick. All right. We click start. All right, and this time it's going to look a lot like the installer, but the CD is not here. So this is doing it from the hard drive. It's going to take the same 10 seconds. You could hit enter, um, but I had stuff to say. So then you see the same sort of messages go across. Bright white is kernel messages. The light gray are um, informational messages that are being displayed. All right. No, there were no error messages, but we could check that later. But now you can log in as the user you set up. So I set up a user called OSIN. And it's going to then show me a window of information. It's going to print a dollar sign, which is the prompt. If I type uname A, it shows me that this is FreeBSD 12.1 release edition, quarterly release, and then this is the um, Git or SVN tag for this release. It's running a generic kernel, it's AMD 64-bit. All right, if I type ls, there's nothing here because we are in, if I type pwd, we're in our home directory and there's nothing there yet, or there isn't anything visible. If I type ls-a, I can see that there are some files already present uh, that were created when I created the user. They came from a set of files that exist on the system. They were copied in here, but um, we'll do some customization of some of these later. But if we do ls and give it a path like the root, we can see that this is a fully populated 12.1 instance. That's kind of, uh, that's the baseline install and it's done. A couple of things I want to show you first. If you're on a uh, Mac or Linux or something like that, um, then you can pull up a terminal window and you should be able to ssh-p, whoops, p2000, I can't type today, p2000 localhost, all right, should work. It'll uh, say the authenticity can't be determined because we don't have its key yet, but we're gonna grab its key and we know that that's our machine. So I'm gonna say, if you wanna continue, yep. And so it added the, this ecdsa key to the list of known hosts. And it says, what's the password for this user at FreeBSD? If you use the same username on the host that you used on the virtual instance, you can just do it this way. And then it'll log in. We're on the FreeBSD box through our terminal window, which is better because we can do copy and paste and stuff like that. So we'll, we'll work with that a little bit. But if you have different username, then you have to supply the username. So I can say dash u or sorry, dash L for login, WSEN at localhost. This has the same effect. What's the password for WSEN? Blah, 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 and so on and so forth, and green smoke, whatever you type in. So that gets us to that point. Let me see if I wanted to add anything else before we bail. Yep, we're gonna do a few more things. If you're on Windows, you can use PuTTY as well. All right, 
So now I'm going to close the SSH instance in case you had a problem getting that installed. I don't want to distract you. So here is the um, the FreeBSD running in a console. This is a virtual machine. And you'll notice that my mouse, when I click into this window, the mouse disappears, which is not particularly helpful. All right, and it's gone for good. I mean, I can move my mouse all over and you never see it again. You have to press the host key to get it back. The host key on Mac is the command key, the little one that looks like a fan. And if you click it, mouse reappears and you get it back and you can click over here and do your stuff and you'll host and then be back over here, you click again and it disappears. If you're on Windows, it could be the control, the left control key, or if you're on a um, Linux, it could be the right control key. Um, but whichever one it is, that's the host key and that gets you in and out of the environment. All right, so how do I get help when I'm in here? You could try typing help. Doesn't the SH, uh, the shell doesn't know anything about help, so it tells you that. There's no help. But there is a thing called man. And if you type man, it says, what man page do you want? Well, let's start with man, man. Give me the man page for, uh, which is a manual page for the manual. Man, man. And it pulls up a man page. When you're in man, and you've never used it before, it can be a little frustrating. Um, it's It tells you what, page you're on, that's the man one. Uh, it's the man page is section one. All the general commands go in section one, and man is a general command. Um, it gives you the name, gives you a little brief synopsis of, or even a brief description, display online man document page. Synopsis tells you that you can give it different command line parameters, and then a, descri a full description of what man page does. And then you're able to excuse me, use your arrow keys up and down, or your um, J and K keys uh, as up and down, and H and L are left and right, but you don't need those here. But you can move up and down, and then you've got that colon prompt. You can also press Enter, which will move one line at a time. Uh, you can also do some other stuff. If you want to know what that other stuff is, you can type H for help, and it gives you the summary of less commands, less is the program that's kind of walking you through this stuff. So learning this is worthwhile. You can go forward a line with the E key or forward a window with the F key, so on and so forth. Um, hit escape or Q when done. Um, you can hit Q, it takes you back to whatever you were on. You can tool around in here. Um, when you're, You can also type something helpful here, is if you know that there's a a, commit, a parameter that you want to look for, you could say, hey, give me the um, dash K, look for dash K, which is the slash will look for whatever you type next. So I did slash and then I said slash uh, O, for example, and that'll move it to the force of use, use of non-local man page. So I do the slash dash O and it takes me directly to it. And if I type in, it takes me to the next instance and so on and so forth. When I'm finally all done, I type Q and it fails from the man page. So that's a little bit about that. Uh, a more useful man page is man ls, because we know that dash a was an interesting parameter. And what does that mean? It says, dash a says, include directory entries whose names begin with a dot. A dot file is a hidden file. You can't normally see them. So ls dash a shows you things with dots, including the dot directory, which is the current directory and the dot dot directory, which is the parent directory. So if I do print working directory, I'm in user home. The dot dot directory is that home directory. So if I cd for change directory and change to dot dot, that takes me to pwd user slash home. So that's a little bit about that. Um, let's update the system and then we will uh, do a couple of little things and we'll be done. So to Update the system. I'm actually going to do the full system update first. So I do FreeBSD. Sorry, we have to be root to do that. So I can exit or I could start it directly, but I'm going to show you this. You can log in as root. Remember that password that you typed before. 
and now I'm as root, and it tells me I'm root, but it also has a pound sign as a prompt instead of a dollar sign. So I know that I'm root. Clear the screen so we can start afresh. All right, and we're going to do FreeBSD, update, fetch, install. This is going to go to the FreeBSD servers, assuming that we set up the networking properly. It's going to fetch some files. It's inspecting the, uh, the current system to see what needs to be updated, and then it's going to download some files, probably 275 or so uh, updates, I think was the last set. This won't take but a minute or two, and then I'll tell you what we're going to do next. So after we get the FreeBSD system updated and patched, uh, which will bring it up to, I think, patch level 7 at this point. Then we're going to do some, well, 490 patches. Well, it's still going to go pretty quick. Um, we'll do a package update and a package upgrade as well um, because the system will have changed and we want our packages to be running current. And then we'll install sudo, which will let us do root-like things as a regular user. And... I'll show you a couple more things about control files and then we will snapshot the environment and we'll be done with this um, video. Next video I'll show how to do how to install a fairly minimal Windows E desktop. It won't take quite as long as this, but it'll work about the same. So it's downloaded all 490 patches and it's applying them. Okay, it's done. It shows us um, the results of it. This is the going to remove these files, the America God tab, whatever the heck that is. Um, it's a time zone that I didn't pick, so I don't care. Um, but it's at the end of that set of updates. So I'm going to click Q, or I'm going to press Q to uh, move to the next file. It says the following files will be added as part of the up up to updating. So it's going to add an NUUK time zone. Yippee. I'm going to click Q. It's going to tell me what files are going to get updated. There's a bunch of them. I'm just, I could use, uh, I could t press H to get the help file, but it's the less command again, and I already know how to use it. So I click Q. I'm gonna look down a little bit, see if there's anything, nah, these are all boot kernel modules. So I'm gonna click Q. It's gonna do the, ins the actual installation, copying the files over. Yeah, and the, um, in the next episode, I'll show you how to install uh, TWM and uh, Lumina. But here we are, we've, we've done the installs, we're done with the updates. Let's do a package upgrade, sorry, update first, because we've never done it. Um, it's gonna have to bootstrap package because it's never used it, so say yep. It's gonna go get it and download the latest package. Won't take but a sec. It'll check signatures, it'll do the install. It's gonna, now it's doing the actual update. It's grabbing the metadata for all the packages that are available, and there's 30,000 of them or something. Maybe more. Lots of software is available. Okay, so our package repository is up to date, so let's do an upgrade. Normally I would say dash Y, but I'll kind of let it prompt me this time. So I do a package upgrade, and it says, hey, your packages are all up to date. Yay. So that being said, I'm going to reboot. Since I'm root, I can type reboot. If I was a regular user, that wouldn't be available. Click reboot or shut down dash R now would work as well. It's just like rebooting a machine. I'm gonna hit enter, don't wanna wait. Awesome, gonna log in as a regular user this time. I'll show you the other way to do this. All right, so now I'm gonna type SU and dash, which is basically uh, become user. And the user I'm gonna become is root, because I don't specify one. And the dash means login. So SU dash, 
and then I type root's password. And now I'm root again. All right, it's like super user become, I guess. All right, so now we're gonna add uh, sudo. So we're gonna package, install, sudo, super user do. It's gonna go look in the repository. It's gonna say, do you wanna install it? It has three requirements, the sudo package itself, index info, and get text. We're gonna say, sure, sounds good to me. So it goes and downloads all three, and sudo is now available. We're gonna, conf we're gonna edit the sudo file, which is done by typing vi sudo. Um, this is gonna open it in vi, and vi has two modes. We're in the first mode, which is command mode or something like that, and then edit mode. For right now, we're looking, we're gonna use sudo, we're gonna use vi, I'm sorry, like we did less. I'm gonna type a slash, and I'm looking for the wheel. Wheel. All right, and there's uncommon to allow members of group wheel to execute any command. And we can use the J and K keys or the arrow keys to go down the line. Um, I can type the zero key, which will take me to the beginning of the line, or the dollar key, which takes me to the end of the line. All right, and I can uncommon it. I'm, this is probably not best practice, but I do it for my local VM instances. I'm actually gonna use the same thing without a password. So I'm gonna type XX, and that's gonna let me run sudo commands by typing sudo without a password, but at least I have to type sudo to, be, to do the root-like things. So I'm gonna type colon, and that's gonna take me back to command mode. I'm sorry, let's back up a little. Uh, yeah, yeah. All right. So what I did was, Okay, was I arrowed down until I got to the line that I wanted to, and then I deleted two characters. To delete characters um, in command mode, I just type X and X, and that's it. Hit escape to make sure I'm in command mode. It, uh, it's in command, command mode now. Type a colon and a write, a W for write, and a Q for quit. Wow, I definitely know VI too well. I have to explain. So I type colon, W, Q. That, We'll write the file. Um, I've edited the buffer, but not the actual file. And I'm going to quit the editor. So I type right Q and that's it. If you mess this up, it could be really painful. So make sure that the only thing that you've done, okay, and uh, is to change the one line where wheel is. And take it out the pound and the space sign. If you did more things than that and you haven't yet exited the editor, you've hit escape, you're at the colon prompt, you can do Q followed by exclamation point and that'll abort your changes. And you can try again, all right? But I changed it, it's all good. I, I can now try it by typing exit to exit the root account. Now I'm back at the regular prompt and I can type sudo ls. And when I do that, it shows me all the files because I'm running it as a super user. And it worked, so sudo is configured. Now's the time to fix it if it's broke. Because if you reboot, you're not gonna be happy, you're not gonna like it. All right, sudo, that's that. Two files I wanna show you before we bail. Um, if we do uname, uh, one other thing, uname-a again, now we can see that we're on release P7, patch level seven. And so our, our information has changed. Two files that you need to be aware of. One is called etc slash rce.conf. This file has your startup information, uh, your configuration. So we set the host name to FreeBSD in the installer. It added this line to Etsy rc.conf. We said use DHCP and enable it unbound, SSHD, MouseD, NTPD, PowerD, dump dev. That's what, if we hadn't selected those, we could enable them directly in the etc rc conf file, which is only um, modifiable by, by root. If you want to know more about the etc rc file, um, you can type uh, cat, which will concatenate or um, copy to terminal the uh, text file. So I'm going to say etc defaults. Hit tab, it does tab completion. Um, and then rc.conf. 
So this is not the rcconf file, this is the defaults file for rc.conf. But you can look in there and uh, say, yeah. And it tells you about some of those settings and what they mean. Like power D flags, uh, this one, well, you can't see my mouse. So, But uh, the bottom line says rcconf files, tells you where they are and that kind of stuff. Um, this one's a little less helpful, but it definitely explains what each of those um, entries means at a kind of high level. The other file that we want to know about, and I'm going to cat it as well, is boot slash loader.conf. And there's nothing in there right now, but if I had uh, uh, a Radeon or an NVIDIA, an NVIDIA video card or something, I'd probably want to load the drivers or something in there. So to find out what's available there, cat boot, actually I will make one change here, to defaults slash loader.conf, and we'll look for auto, let's see what we get. Sorry, we'll, oh, I should tell you what I'm doing. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna send this to grep, and then we'll look for the word auto in loader.conf, and it's got uh, that. Uh, auto boot delay equals 10. We're going to do that. So um, one useful utility that you can learn before we bail here is we're going to use sudo. We're going to say sysrc um, auto boot delay equals quote 1. We're going to change it to 1. Now if we cat slash boot slash loader.conf. My bad. <laughs> We'll have to do a little repair. Yay. Dash F slash boot slash the default file that it works with is um, rc.conf. We're going to have it edit bootloader.conf. So now it has an auto boot delay in loader.conf. But since I screwed it up, we'll have to fix it in etsy slash rc.conf. We want to get rid of this one. You could also use sysrc to get rid of it, but this is easier for me. Okay, so now it's done. If we reboot now, if we try to reboot as a regular user, it's not gonna let us, so we're gonna use sudo reboot one last time, and then we'll be done. We'll see how what changed here, and hopefully it didn't break anything. It comes up. It boots the menu in one second, it auto boots. It gives me time to hit a key if I need to, but doesn't otherwise get in the way. Boots up, gonna let me log in. All right, there we go. That's it. Congratulations. Hopefully that worked for you. Leave comments if you need to.